to The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. Behind every legend or myth, there is often a kernel of truth. So what of the legend of the vampire? Could the legends of reanimated corpses feeding on human blood be true? Tonight, we'll meet a supposed vampire slayer who claims to have hunted down and destroyed a number of vampires, including one in London in the early 1970s. We'll also meet a paranormal investigator who suggests there is some truth to the vampire legends, and a skeptic who predictably asserts that these stories are completely unfounded. Our mission is to investigate these claims and follow the truth wherever it may lead. It's time to redefine reality. Genetic enigma or a human alien hybrid. There was at least two guns in one with bombing from the nose. Is it possible technology can alter weather patterns created by the human race? Has been engineered by the Illuminati. I'm here on the south coast of England where I've tracked down Britain's scourge of the undead, the descendant of Lord Byron, and the man at the center of the Highgate vampire story, the Bishop Sean Manchester. Bishop Manchester, how did you become involved in the Highgate Cemetery vampire case? Well, in the early months of 1967, two 16-year-old students were traveling home after a, a party of some sort and went past the north gate of the Western Cemetery. And as they did so in the dark hours, they witnessed what they believed to be uh, a body, one of them said bodies, rising from the grave. And they were terrified by the spectre they beheld. We knew from years earlier where so many animals, mostly foxes in the Highgate Cemetery area, were discovered with lacerations of the throat and drained of so much blood that the RSPCA could not carry out a forensic examination. They were so exsanguinated that the RSPCA said, could only confirm death by l loss of blood. Rosemary Ellen Guiley is a paranormal investigator and the author of the Encyclopedia of Vampires and Werewolves. Rosemary, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. Thank you, Richard. There are many cases of vampiric entities in folklore around the world who have a taste for human blood. There's ample historical evidence that vampires do exist. More often than not, the vampire was described as a specter, that is a spirit who left the grave and was being sustained by the corpse left behind. But we do have cases where whatever was walking around attacking people was so real and so lifelike to people that they thought it was the actual person in some sort of phantom-like form. What are vampires? Are they physical entities? Are they spiritual entities? The source, the supernatural source, is entirely um, a demonic entity. By using blood as the base, these particular wraiths can manifest in tangible form, hence the blood, which um, was recognized by the ancients, um, certainly ancient civilizations, as the life. The legends of the incubus and succubus, are they also uh, rooted in the vampire legend? Vampires are very sexually randy by nature. We find this in folklore. It was the Victorians who sanitized that in literature because it wasn't proper to talk about those sorts of things. So Dracula, for example, his blood drinking becomes an erotic substitute for that. But centuries ago, our ancestors would have been very familiar with a vampire who would come back and want sex. Sex from spouses, even family members, and if that wasn't enough, they would start attacking everyone else in the village as well. This modern word vampire, I mean, the word itself is a difficult word because you don't have to go very far back. Uh, the word didn't even exist. The word comes from Eastern Europe and the general area. And prior to that, when you go back a thousand years, they're really just talking about the walking dead, revisiting the living. So a vampire is thereby a demonic, predatory entity, wraith, being, which manifests as a dead person. My own supposition is that we're dealing with spirit forms rather than actual walking corpses. She 
led us in her trance state, I suppose, to the place where we eventually located the lair. One hundred and thirty years after Bram Stoker's Dracula was written, vampires continue to permeate pop culture, almost as immortal as the blood-sucking demons themselves. But is there any substantial truth to the legend of the vampires? The Highgate vampire case was a genuine vampire scare. And when some animals were found mutilated and seemingly drained of their blood, people suspected vampires. The Highgate Cemetery is quite haunted and very spooky. I mean, it has to be said, this was really a very disturbing case. Two years later, Elizabeth, by this time she had moved in a, a flat of her own in the Highgate area, and she was now suffering some perfectly dreadful nightly visitations. She describes the nightmares of, of, of a, a pale face appearing at the window, um, and wanting to come in, wanting to, wanting to be allowed in. Th these nightmares where she was left absolutely bereft of energy, everything drained from her. It somehow just sort of takes it supernaturally from you and leaves you feeling very wasted and ill. Uh, there are cases where people say that they have actually been bitten and the entities drank their blood. And then came the occasion when she woke up to discover blood on her pillow, little specks of blood, and punctures, very tiny. I mean, when I say punctures, I'm, we're talking barely anything more than a pinprick. We managed to use the traditional antidotes and repellents to protect her and to ward off the supernatural presence that was trying to take possession of her. The Highgate Vampire case is really an example of modern legend making. Let's talk about the Highgate Vampire incident. Well, the Highgate case is, if we just took the word vampire out, it was a real case. But there's no evidence that uh, it had anything really to do with vampirism other than in a kind of um, you know, that was the, that was the subject, that was the, the topic that people were hyping. And um, a lot of folks uh, got on the bandwagon and uh, there were sightings. A couple of uh, self-styled vampirologists claimed that there were, that there was at least a vampire roaming about the Highgate Cemetery in London. You know, there's, there's a phenomenon that, that psychologists call contagion. If you start uh, an idea, contagion will have an effect among susceptible people. Well, this set off a hue and cry to hunt down the vampire. People armed with hammers and stakes stormed the cemetery, climbed the walls, and went looking in the crypts for a vampire corpse. And that's when the case really opened up and became almost a full-time uh, matter. But a lot of stories arose, and that stimulated more vampire hunters. And uh, pretty soon we got kind of a, a warring deal between two, did I say self-styled, vampirologists. Due to the media interest, and due to the fact that the genie was out of the bottle, it was on Reuters, it was everywhere, it allowed people to make contact who we would have never otherwise heard from. One of these people, was prone to somnambulating like Elizabeth had been. She led us in her trance state, I suppose, to the place where we eventually located the lair. What's happening there is that your body is still asleep, so when you wake into this state between being awake and asleep, and your body's still asleep, you have the sensation, it's called sleep paralysis you're actually unable to move, because it's rather frightening. And you hallucinate. One of the vampirologists I believe you're referring to is the Bishop Sean Manchester. Now he made the claim that he met a young woman who lived on the border of Highgate Cemetery. 
and uh, I came to him and told him she was having some very disturbing uh, night terrors. She seemed to exhibit uh, extreme uh, anemia, and he witnessed two puncture wounds, two tiny puncture wounds on her neck. What do you make of those claims? Well, if that's all we have, the evidence is not before the court. Such evidence is, you know, very easily misperceived. There was an extra casket in a vault which shouldn't have been there and was in completely different condition. And that made the discovery of what, in truth, is the first encounter of what became known, dubbed by the press, to be the Highgate Vampire. Did you open the coffin? Yes, and what we saw satisfied us that we were dealing with um, a supernatural presence. When you opened the casket, what, what did you see? Well, uh, something which on first sight looks like a th three to five to seven day old corpse. But on clo well, not even closer examination, quickly one realizes this is, this is not a corpse in, in the ordinary sense at all. Anyone that is familiar with corpses has seldom any doubt that they're, they are dead. The teeth had gouts of fresh blood, and the teeth all the teeth did seem um, exaggerated, as well they might. And whilst we, we quibble over, is it a corpse, is it dead, is it undead, is it simply a, a phantasm which looks like a corpse, but in actual fact, it's simply a demon convincing you of what it is, but it isn't. It's a demon simply manipulating you. And I can, I can see how all these things are possible in different ways. The fact remains, this, this was something of pulsating evil. So I believe it was a malevolent entity that possibly had the uh, ability to drain energy. But people don't realise, of course, that this figure has still been seen in the modern era. These figures were said to be um, demons, um, which were said to inhabit the souls um, of the dead. They make for good stories. What about other vampire legends in England? Uh, there's several. There was one um, from Scotland several decades ago called the Gorbals Vampire. This was in parts of Glasgow where children were reporting this iron-toothed creature that was attacking children. Again, people believe it was just a product of hysteria. There's been one called the Crogglin Grange Vampire from several decades ago. There's also the Berwick Vampire in Scotland. And these are all kind of stories concerning sort of bedroom invaders, but there's no real substance to these stories. And I believe a lot of these, they have their moment and they just gradually fizzle out into folklore. Do you think there are any credible stories of vampires in uh, Britain? Again, it depends how our own perception of vampirism is. And if you go all over the world, there are reports of people who in their bedroom of a night are attacked by amorphous blobs and also entities which they describe as an old hag or a shadowy type of figure. What's happening there is that your body is still asleep. So when you wake into this state between being awake and asleep and your body's still asleep, you have the sensation, it's called sleep paralysis you're actually unable to move, because it's rather frightening. And you hallucinate a demon, a vampire. In the Victorian era, people would see a ghost and they would be transfixed with fear and unable to move. Today, same phenomenon. People wake up, see aliens around their bed, and the aliens have them somehow tied down and they think they're aboard a spaceship. These things come in the night, they drain your breath, they drain your energy, they can even take from you your blood. And I believe this is where the legend of the vampire has come about. And over the years, Hollywood has dressed it up, but that is not what a vampire is. I've had people say to me, these incidents, could it not be your own dark fears manifesting that you're, that you're witnessing, that you're, it, it's something in you that you're very real, but not, not, physical. It's something which you're dealing with in yourself. And I understand that sort of psychological analysis. But um, no, no, Th this was terribly real. The problem is the devil. The problem is this legion of demons. The problem is 
that he is still with us. For most people, a vampire is the stuff of mere legend, uh, the subject of gothic novels or a Hollywood uh, depiction. What would you say to people who don't believe that vampires exist? Well, um, pretty much the same as I would say to people who disbelieve the, the rest of uh, the supernatural realm. I mean, today, um, most people dismiss angels, demons, ghosts, and vampires are simply part of that. I mean, if they sp specifically um, dismiss vampires, as sometimes happens, and not the rest, that could be due to the um, misrepresentation uh, by Hollywood, um, but also because of the corporeal aspect attributed to the phenomenon, which for many people is difficult to take. I understand that, um, but it, there are precedents and the vampire's been with us since the beginning of uh, time, certainly since the beginning of civilization. Okay, I mean, there were all, already, of course, vampire legends and uh, there were other stories, but Bram Stoker, you know, created the vampire as modern fiction and it's just resonant with us, partly because it taps into, it works as a metaphor. The vampire is alluring because he's death-defying. He doesn't die like the rest of us, and that's the ultimate human fear, what happens to us after we die. As the vampire has evolved in our fiction and film, the creature has become more and more glamorous. Not only does he defy death, he's evolved from a one-dimensional monster into a three-dimensional, practically living human being. He's got a personality, he has superpowers, he's exotic. All of these things are very appealing to people. The church actually does believe in external um, evil, that it is um, something which exists outside of us. But many people today subscribe to the view that um, such things as the supernatural God, the devil, only exist if you believe it. It's a sort of Jungian principle. But um, the church, thankfully, uh, certainly does believe in, uh, in evil as an external reality. And I do, for sure. And uh, it's what to do when confronted by it. Is a cross effective against vampires? Well, it certainly is popular in the movies. The vampire cult is actually pagan in origin, uh, the cult that we're familiar with from Eastern Europe. And the pagans had many ways of dealing with these evil entities. The Christians introduced the cross as the ultimate weapon against anything evil. Crosses may work for some people. Almost anything that you place a lot of your faith in spiritually as a protection against evil could work against a vampire, but you have to believe. So, are we to believe the account of the Bishop Sean Manchester that an actual vampire was preying on victims in the Highgate Cemetery area of London? Or was this event another example of modern legend building? This is where it becomes awkward for people because they, they, they just cannot come to terms, particularly in this day and age, of such things. I find it difficult to understand their difficulty unless, of course, they don't believe in such things altogether. Why don't you believe in the possibility of a vampire? Because vampires, in that sense of the word, of fanged sort of gents walking around in suave cloaks are just the stuff of Hollywood. Vampires, to me, are ethereal entities. The problem is the devil. The problem is his legion of demons. The problem is that he is still with us. We heard from a paranormal investigator who says she believes in the possibility of real vampires. According to her theory, real vampires are non-physical entities, spirits of the dead, perhaps. And tonight's skeptic, Joe Nickel, is correct, of course, when he asserts there is not a single shred of scientific evidence for the existence of real vampires. But 
If you believe in the unseen spirit world, in angels and demons, for example, then you at least have to be open to the possibility of corporeal manifestations from the demonic realm, and that includes actual vampires. They exist, they, they have occurred, and they are real. Just how often they occur is difficult to say, because no longer are we living in times when people, and the majority of the church for that matter, uh, are willing to accept their, their existence. Let's just hope and pray that we can take the Bishop Sean Manchester at his word when he says, real vampires are extremely rare. I'd like to know what you think. You can contact us here at The Conspiracy Show through the website, www.theconspiracyshow.com. In the meantime, don't be afraid. Move over, Aphrodite. I'm coming home. Good night.